Okay. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and don't forget, Announcer Man. Howdy hey, y'all. oh, <laughs> that's what happens when you can't see each other. <laughs> Howdy, y'all. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. V- volume 2. No, no. Oh, we don't do that anymore. Okay, uh, episode number 135. <laughs> this is Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And we're your hosts, usually. Yeah, we, we host this thing we call a show. Loosely. And interestingly enough, uh, we actually have a special, a very special guest. Another one? Yes. It's, oh, it's, oh, oh, can I guess who it is? Is it the girl who played the waitress in Avengers who got saved by Captain America and they're interviewing her and at the end of the movie she says, I, Captain America saved me and I don't know if the Avengers are good or bad, but th- did you see that the, his chest was like completely hairless? <laughs> and she was the child on Growing Pains before Leonardo DiCaprio showed up. Remember? Yes, that, no, that's who it is. I bet I can not even remember her name. Oh. I liked that girl, though, you know? She had a a featured extra role, it seemed like, at first. And then all of a sudden, she had a little bit of a speech at the end. And she was somebody important. Important. But no, yeah, we we don't have somebody important, per se, today. We just... We, uh, Brian Lincoln is here with us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Brian Lincoln! Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, man, we've never done this before. Be gentle. Never? You never had a guest? No. Well, <laughs> we have had we've never had any guests uh, what's this what's the ah never why does my brain do that to me all the time was it an yeah. author i'm trying to follow N- no it. no i was any guess ever sulu what's friggin oh. sulu's real name george oh, Decay. George Decay. okay i thought the robot cut that part out <laughs> no robot actually put that i think he looped it played it three times in a row we lost half our listeners that week <laughs> <laughs> we had sound wave we had Fake Sean Connery on the show. All right. <laughs> but we've never had anybody a real like, guest like this. That's true. Yes, we're uh, live through the magic of Skype. We've got Brian Lincoln on the line. He was the producer for today's uh, story, um, which is called Harlan's Wake, and it's by John Miro, which yep, rhymes, rhymes with, with hero. hero. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we'll have lots of questions for him, and and we'll be able to ask him all the things that we never get to ask people. When we hear an episode that we didn't produce ourselves, and we go, oh gosh, I wonder how they got that voice effect, or I wonder why they cut that one line, or I wonder where the sound effect, you know, any, all these questions. Well, I'm sure there'll be a laundry list. Yeah, I'm excited about that, to be able to get all those things answered, because usually we're just like, yeah, I don't know why you picked that. We'll never know. (laughs) So, screw you guys. But first, obviously, we want to uh, play you the story so you can know what we're talking about. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump right into that. Uh, About the author. Yes. Thank you, announcer man. John Miro. What does it rhyme with? Hero. Oh, I mean. (laughs) Also zero. Thank you very much. Write stories about worlds and comfort zones being set on their head. He populates them with the realest people he can conjure. After the idea and the characters, the writing is like a science experiment fueled by action, plot, and reaction, what characters do. When both work right, when all the elements come together, he sets the story loose on unsuspecting readers. Harlan's Wake was initially released as an ebook via servingworlds.com. At Serving Worlds, you will find links to commentary, interviews, and and all published fiction by John Miro. So yes, today's story was produced by Brian Lincoln, and it's going to be good. So (laughs) sit back and relax and get ready. You're in for a treat. Journey with us into racism. (laughs) Harlan's Wake by John Miro. Standing in the familiar field of windblown grass, Tyler watched the firelight from the top of the hill. 
Over the rustling of trees came the strumming of guitar, banjo, and muffled words. No place like home, he told himself, and strode through the wildflowers towards the cabin where he'd been born. The wind brought the smell of the fire to him, and he hoped it would wash the smell of the dead from him. As he neared the old woodshed that marked the start of his family's land, the wind carried something new to him, a woman's muffled sobs. His eyes pierced the shadow of the dangerously leaning shed with the leaky tin roof and captured the frame of a large woman huddled on a tree. Each sob wrenched her shoulders until they froze and her head swung in his direction. Eyes still sharp as a hawk, Tyler thought. It's me, Anby. Tyler. The woman rose. Stiff legs shuffled forward. Tyler? Little Ty? The shape gathered steam, stumbling towards him and emitting a peal of gleeful laughter. Why, I knew you'd come, boy. Didn't pay no never mind to that sourpuss brother of yours telling us all how fire important you take your job. Aunt Vida shook him by the shoulders, still strong despite her 66 years, then tugged him out of the shadows of the decrepit woodshed towards a group of people gathered around the fire. <laughs> Look what I found sniffing round out back. The music of guitars and banjos jarred to a halt, and the remnants of the Brown clan turned as one at Aunt Vida's roar. A dog barked and leapt around Tyler and his aunt as they approached. Blue! Tyler greeted the dog silently, grateful for the excuse to look away as his uncle and his two older unmarried cousins watched with frowning faces as Vida dragged her long-favored nephew into the flickering light. Tyler let his aunt take his military issue pack and nervously rubbed his hands against the sides of his UN fatigues. A thick silence overtook the men of the Brown clan, broken only by the tumble of a log in the fire. Vida growled. Now, listen, you flea-bitten goats. He came to see his pops, same as you. He came, and I don't want y'all digging up things best left in the past. You hear? Her hand propelled Tyler forward into the circle. He nodded to the group as he patted the head of the hound nuzzling his thigh, far happier to see him than any of his family looked, gathered around the fire. Uncle Hugh, Jack, Marty. Somber nods all around. The fire burnt itself down some more. Its heat licked at Tyler's side, but he didn't move. Jack kept his eyes on the ground, and Marty waited on his father's worn granite scowl. The wooden looks and Vida's tears suddenly put a frightening thought into Tyler's head. Was he too late? Is, is he? Tyler started to say, but he couldn't finish. Uncle Hugh grunted. He tossed the stick he was whittling into the fire and pushed his straw hat back on his forehead with the blade of his jackknife. White hair and leathery skin framed the eyes that looked Tyler up and down. Strong farmer's hands closed the knife. And finally he shook his head. No, boy. He's stuck in a world of hurt, mind. My guess. He's been waiting for you to get clear of those zombies long enough to... Aunt Vida growled behind Tyler. Uncle Hugh glared at her, but whatever he saw on his sister's face trumped his anger. Your pa's asleep, he said. But Tom's with him, so you just wait your turn, he warned, his voice as cold as his face. At the mention of his brother, the old anger roiled in his belly, but now it was mixed with equal parts guilt. The fire licked painfully at his leg, but he bore it like a penance. My father is dying, and I wasn't here. Hugh looked past Tyler to his sister for a long moment, then met Tyler's eyes. A nod of greeting, then his hand stretched to the convenient log behind the newcomer. Sit down, boy. For your legs well done. So Tyler sat, suffering a face full of licks from Blue before the dog leapt back out into the night. Jack's fingers picked at his banjo again, and Vida smiled in her brother's direction before sitting down beside Tyler. Marty pressed a chip mason jar into Tyler's hands with a half-smile, and Tyler nodded back, grateful, then sipped the liquid fire and winced. Tyler Brown had come home at last. Dreaming.
Tyler walked between his primary and the street, right hand near the butt of his pistol, and left hand sketching subtle signs for the rest of the security detail to follow as they passed the waist-high wire fence holding the mob of screaming civilians on the sidewalk. Some carried signs scrawled with hate or praise. Some wore expressions of anger or love or fear. One carried a long, thin stake of nickel. Tyler caught a glimpse of it beneath the man's leather bomber jacket and instinctively shoved his left hand back into the primary's chest, drawing his sidearm with his right. The attacker clubbed Tyler's gun away with the post of the sign he carried and raised the stake above his head as he vaulted over the fence. Tyler's eyes raced to his backup, saw he'd been distracted long paces away where the crowd had heaved against the fence. Alone, he acted. Tyler leapt into the air, pushing his body between the silver he guarded and the nickel spike that would end his long, long life. The world shuddered as the stake buried itself in Tyler's chest. The world shuddered again as a boot dug painfully into Tyler's hip. Get up, Barbie boy! Tyler's leg spun clear of the blankets he wore and pushed against the boot. Its wearer stumbled, crying in surprise as he regained his balance. Arms balled in fists and spread for attack. Tyler's eyes slitted open against the morning light. Blue yelped in surprise and clattered off the bed, following a blurry form that backed silently out the door almost before Tyler recognized the red and black plaid shirt. The old jeans, the absurdly big walnut-handled hunting knife that his brother Tom always wore. Tyler sagged back onto one elbow. Deflecting a pissed-off kick like it was a knife attack wasn't how he'd seen their reunion getting started. He shook his head in a silent curse, and his head began to throb. (sighs) Almost forgot how bad Uncle Hugh's shine kicked, Tyler thought, realizing the little he'd had the night before was still way, way too much. There were others in his father's small cabin, too many people for his overloaded senses, and smells from the kitchen his brain couldn't handle. He stood and fled. His head throbbed worse when he pushed the squeaking screen door wide and stepped out into the bright morning sunshine. The chop of Tom's axe did little to alleviate the pain, as wood flew apart with violent force on the block before his brother. He should be up soon, Tom said as he wiggled the axe blade free from the block. The prodigal son rubbed the backs of his hands against both his eyes, tearing in the raw sunshine, and took in deep breaths in his attempt to rid himself of his first moonshine headache in six years. Tom didn't look, or let up from his chopping. He watched on silently, recalling the cords of wood the two of them had run through to prove themselves against each other in their youth. In his mind's eye, he could still see his father sitting on the front steps, smoking his corncob pipe and judging the boy's many competitions. How long does he have? Now the axe sunk into the chopping block down to the haft, Tom's shoulders flexing almost to the limit of his frayed plaid shirt with his powerful swing. Tyler could hear his brother blow the air from his lungs angrily as he abandoned the axe and stood straight. One massive hand pushed his black hair back from his eyes and turned back towards the house. And Tyler... We're all real glad you could take the time from playing hero for the zombies to attend Pa's funeral, brother. But don't fret none. I'm sure he'll be dead before your weekend pass from the boogeyman expires. Tom's face switched from angry to disinterested in a split second, infuriating Tyler as it always had, worse than any slap in the face or kick to the hip. Tom dusted his hands off and walked closer making a show of perusing his brother's lieutenant's stripes and whistling with feigned interest before shouldering roughly past. Tyler burned from head to toe, a captive to anger and his inexplicable shame, as Tom stomped up the wooden stairs and slammed the peeling screen door behind him. Looking down, he saw his arms stiff at his side and knew his back had gone ramrod straight in a defensive parody of standing at attention. He tried to relax, but found he didn't know how. The porch door screeched again. Come get some food in you, boy, Uncle Hugh said, mouth half closed around his pipe. He looked around the yard, past the tractor and the sheds, and let his eyes creep up the hill he'd climbed down the night before. Tyler had spent his childhood running through the miles of forest all around, hunting cougar and bear with Tyler and Pa. But that was another life ago, and right now he couldn't remember the last time this place felt like home. 
Aunt Vi's cooking was the one thing that hadn't changed. Her fresh-baked buns, sizzling bacon and eggs, and cool apple cider had Tyler's mouth watering before he even reached the table. His few moments of fresh air, along with a couple ancient crumbling aspirin from the bathroom, had been enough to chase away the worst of his headache. The food had chased away the rest. Washing down the last bite with a sip of hot coffee, fresh from Vida's battered old percolator, he couldn't remember the last time he'd enjoyed a meal as much. It wasn't that the chow in the army was bad. Well, actually it was, but since he joined the silver security detail, he'd gotten used to eating in some of the finest restaurants in the world. Still in all, nothing beats homemade, Tyler thought, smiling up at his aunt as she refilled his coffee. Uncle Hugh, Jack, Marty, and Tom all shoveled their food quickly and quietly, leaving Vida to fill the hole in conversation as she refilled the men's plates. The Chase homestead burned down, you know. The nearest neighbors are the Harkleys over the hill. Your brother cleared all the nettles from around the pond, so the rabbits are out for his head. Almanac says we're in for the worst winter of the decade, but your father says... Vida's brain caught up with her gossip's mouth, realizing whose name she just used aloud. Her voice faded to nothing. His younger cousin Jack's curiosity overcame his hunger, and over a mouthful of eggs he asked, What, what are they like, Ty? Marty's spoon slowed down to a crawl to listen to the response, and Tyler dove into the friendly conversation. The Silvers? Two heads nodded as one. Do they crawl up inside people while they're dying? Jack blurted. Or do they have to be goners, real stiff and smelly lack? Marty finished for him. Uncle Jack pushed his plate away with a grimace. Tyler suppressed a chuckle and leaned forward over his plate to settle what sounded like a long-standing debate when a shadow fell across the table. Looking back, Tyler saw Tom standing beside his chair, his fists balled up tight at his side. Pause up. After breakfast, Uncle Hugh and his boys headed back home. After seeing them out, Aunt Vida bent to the dishes, and Tyler followed his brother into their father's small bedroom at the back of the cabin. The smell of linseed oil and vapor rub hung to the walls of the drab old bedroom. Tyler's face went numb as he stared down at his father stretched out on the bed. Harlan Brown had been the biggest, strongest man Tyler had ever known. The skeletal figure he saw now bore no resemblance to that man. Advanced cancer of the lung, left undiagnosed until far too late. Harlan hadn't seen a doctor in fifteen years, until the day he'd fallen while tilling his fields, gagging on his own blood. Blue whimpered, threading past Tyler and lying down on the threadbare rug at Harlan's side. Emotions churned inside Tyler. He turned away from the wheezing form and caught a glimpse of a familiar corncob pipe on the bureau. He remembered the smell of it filling the small cabin that he, his brother, and father had lived in all their lives. Until the day, six years gone, that Tyler enlisted. The ground seemed to shake under his feet, and a silent movie of times gone by flashed through his mind. Christmas, and gifts hewn by his father's skilled hand from branch and bow. Tyler's small hands wrestling his father's then strong arms at the kitchen table, straining against a patient, grinning giant. Sitting sullenly with his brother on the front porch, presenting childish disputes to the wise man of the house whittling a corncob pipe one Father's Day. Tyler! The shivering form whispered, then moaned. Tyler knelt beside his father, shivering beneath sweat-stained sheets. Harlan's eyes in their hollow sockets were unseeing. His thin blue lips twisted to manage close approximation of words. Uh, yes, Pa? Don't you play near that pond, here? Nettle's gonna tear your pants. Can't. Can't afford new pants every... (coughs) Harsh, wet choking cut off the fevered words. Pa? Tyler lay his hand on his father's shoulder, horrified at the lightness, the limpness of it. Pa, can you hear me? Harlan gagged again, (laughs) a trickle of saliva and blood collecting at the corner of his mouth. The choking ramped into violent barking, accompanied by body-shaking spasms. Tyler helped his father sit up. Tom roughly forced a cool, wet cloth into his brother's hands and walked woodenly out the door. Tyler swallowed back his own tears and ran a clean patch of cloth over his father's searing forehead, while the old man weeped in his arms. (laughs) 
Tyler had seen his first silver on a trip to the general store for supplies. Actually, he saw them online at the Shooter County Library, which he visited eagerly each month for a new stack of books and a trip to the World Wide Web that most of the First World took for granted, but Tyler still thought of almost as magic. Aliens. First contact with ambassadors of a nomadic alien civilization who came knocking on Earth's door as they passed on through. The world invited them to visit, and they obliged. Some saw them as saviors, with their knowledge of science and the universe. Some saw their nature as monstrous, the appearance of some of their number hideous, as they hid in fear, or worse. Tyler saw them as a billboard the world had painted just at him, and the message was clear. The whole world had just changed, and it was well past time that his did too. Tom ran the small herds and crop fields of the family farm easily. As eldest son, the homestead was his birthright, and he wanted the farm. The choice was easy for Tyler. He joined the army at City Hall that very day. It was the only way he knew to get out of Shooter County then, before he figured out it was where he belonged. That split-second decision led him through a grueling basic army training that taught him as much about himself and his abilities as it did the world that existed beyond Shooter County. He emerged from BASIC at the top of his class, just in time to volunteer for the first United Nations Silver Security Detail. On his first furlough, Tyler had returned home, excited to tell his family of the place he had made for himself in the world. Aunt Vida relieved Tyler from his father's side after a time and sent him to find his brother. Tom was out on the porch, leaning against one of the rough wooden beams and staring at an old wooden swing hanging from the roof by chain link. It swung a little in the wind, empty. Their father's swing. Tyler slid to the ground beside Tom, welcoming the cloying smell of Tom's cigarette both as a penance and a relief from the coppery smell of his father's blood all down the front of his clothes. Tom pinched the butt and flicked it from the porch, exhaling blue smoke. He ain't come out of the past for a week now. Some days, he don't wake up at all. The grass was burning badly under the summer sun, Tyler noticed as he tracked the cigarette through the air to the ground, absorbing his brother's words as best he could manage. He was too proud to call for you when he got sick, Ty, Tom whispered. But I knew he wanted to see you. Once he took to seeing things, he'd just smile and call for his tyke, like when you was little. Tyler squeezed his eyes tight, but nothing could block the memory of his father's painful spasms. Tom jerked himself to his feet and towered over his brother. I hate you for leaving. Tyler looked up, stricken, into his brother's enraged face. Tom's chest heaved, the venom finally working itself out after years of festering. He was scared, goddammit. Lots of people are scared of them monsters, Ty. He, He was mostly scared for you. Always for you. Without warning, Tom's fist struck Tyler across the jaw. The powerful blow sent his head smashing into the porch. He landed on his right shoulder, and a searing agony exploded in the bandaged wound below his collarbone. It felt like a freight train. Still, Tyler didn't move. Tom's blow had torn the scab from an older, greater pain, and he offered no resistance as he waited for the next blow to fall. It never did. Tyler looked up at his brother. A few creaks of the swing later, Tom had forced his right hand open, watching it and talking as if to himself. I ain't sorry for hitting you, but I don't. I don't hate you for leaving, he whispered. And I'm trying not to hate you for taking a piece of the old man's heart with you. Tom held out his arm. Tyler grabbed at the hand and the welcome like a drowning man. Tom pulled him easily to his feet and held on to Tyler as hard as a vice. It was the first time they'd touched in six years. At least you're in time to help me bury him. Tyler heard the loss in his brother's choking words, and guessed it was the first time Tom had accepted their father's fate aloud. Tom's fingers went limp on the last word. Tearing his hands free, he fled the porch in Tyler's presence. He's a good son. Aunt Vida stepped out onto the porch and rubbed Tyler's shoulder. They watched Tom storm out of sight into the trees. Just needs a little time, Ty. Get to know you again. 
I was proud when I heard what you did for the creature in New York, Ta. We all were, she added with a toss of her head toward the now vacant yard. The tender moment passed, and Vida slapped him hard on the back. Come on in. Have another coffee and warm up. Huh! Am army rack smell rap? We need to fix you some clean clothes, boy. Tyler accepted an old red hunting shirt and a pair of his brother's jeans, belt cinched tight around his smaller frame. The coffee warmed his bones, and Vida's happy bustling and relaying of the local gossip warmed him deeper inside. There weren't as many neighbors as there'd been six years ago, but she still knew the whereabouts, why fors and whatnots of each and every resident of Shooter County like the back of her hand. The damn cheese boys are still around here, stirring up trouble. I'd feel sorry for them if they hadn't been their own damn fault, burning their house up like that. Silly buggers brewing whiskey in their own damn bathtub. Vi hooted and slapped the table. These ways the folks are okay. Bought into a retirement condominium in Price City. Left those boys hot and dry and meaner than ever to hear told. Vida settled her weight into a creaking chair. Now, how long will you stay, nephew? Not sure, Tyler answered, spinning the last gulp of coffee in the bottom of his cup, enjoying the image of the three chase boys shivering in their underwear on a cold October night while their house burned up, little explosions of whiskey coloring the flames. I'll stay as long as Pa... <coughs> Tyler coughed to hide the sudden tightness in his throat. Vida pursed her lips. Tyler, the good Lord will take my brother soon, I don't doubt. And good thing, too. man as proud as your daddy shouldn't waste away for so long. She rolled her eyes. It's a hard thing, Ty, to come home like this. But the wake proper is starting tonight, so you're going to get near full of what your daddy's been like his whole life. Uh, it's something to look forward to. He nodded. Thank you for sending for me, Vi. The big woman gently swatted Tyler's hand, then laid hers down on top of his. No need to thank me for that. Your family. Then she leaned in conspiratorially. Now, tell an old gossip, Ty. What are them creatures really like? Where do I begin? Tyler wondered. The Silvers changed everything. Changed him. Tyler watched his father toss the satellite phone, a miraculous hunk of technology he'd saved six months of salary to pay for, into the flaming hearth. He couldn't move, couldn't speak. He was frozen in complete terror at the anger which his father and brother had greeted him with. Harlan chewed on his pipe and watched the plastic casing of the phone crack and warp. Then, as if seeing the pipe for the first time as the gift from his youngest son that it was, he turned and threw it into Tyler's face. Tyler jerked back from the pipe as if he'd been slapped. You turned your back on your family when you left. Now, you serve these... these demons? You're damned, boy! You damned yourself in front of God! Tyler turned to his brother who stood with his arms folded, refusing to meet his eyes. Tom? He pleaded. The family farm, Tom's love, had gone bust not long after Tyler left home. Something had gone missing from Tom's eyes after that. He worked at the mill now, and his muscles and his stare were harder and colder than ever. He was as silent as stone now. Harlan Brown stormed across the room, grabbing Tyler's jaw with his massive hand, as if he were a child, Tyler whimpered and stumbled backwards where his father pushed him. You betrayed God to serve demons! Harlan screamed, spearing Tyler with wild eyes as he continued to push his son back viciously. You betrayed your family! With a final shove, Harlan sent Tyler falling back through the screen door and onto his back on the porch. Don't come here again! I don't know you, and I don't want to. As of now, before God... I only have one son. (laughs) Tyler sobbed, but Harlan silenced him with a kick to the stomach that sent him tumbling off the porch to land in dirt and pine needles. Tyler lay there, sobbing, until he heard the door open again. He looked back up to the house and saw Tom, silent, face pale and his jaw clenched. Tom threw Tyler's army-issued duffel back at him. 
You chose! He snarled down at his brother. Then he turned on his heel and slammed the door behind him. Tyler shook his head to clear it of the past. Across the table, Aunt Vi sat patiently, obviously eager to hear his tales of the Silvers, more like a schoolgirl than the bullish matriarch of 66 years that she was. The Silvers are smart. All of them. Not just some of them, like with us humans. Einstein's every one. They enjoy teaching and learning and tearing things apart. Conversations they love, too. They're big debaters. Tyler scratched at the stubble growing on his face. He wasn't accustomed to it after shaving daily for years to pass muster. They have emotions, but it takes a lot to bring them out. No oh, hell, I'm not saying this right. He struggled to put his impressions to words. You know what happened in New York? I watched my silver stroll away from an attempt on his life, confident in my team's ability to protect him and as serene as can be. Then, not 24 hours later, he stripped down to his jockey shorts and played volleyball with us on the beach, just to see what it was like. He chuckled at the image of the stoic alien, still and calm one moment and spitting out a mouthful of sand the next. <laughs> you know what it is about them, Aunt Vi? I mean, once you're used to the idea that these guys are from out there, it's that they are so in tune with the world. I know it sounds corny, but my guy can act like a baby that's never been screwed up by the world one minute and as wise as a near-immortal space-traveling alien symbiote the next. Blue maneuvered between the legs of Ida's chair, and she rubbed him behind the ears. What's his name? You're silver. Well, right now I have one that's just been hosted, Michael. After I wrestled down that nut with a gun in New York, he asked for me. Shifting her weight in the groaning chair, Vida pursed her lips again. Blue reevaluated his position an inch back out from under the rickety chair. Those old ones sure are ugly, Ty. Face like a fried egg with a shell mixed in. She put her hand to her forehead and closed her eyes. And them slimy tentacles. Ugh. Straight out of them drive-in monster movies. Tyler nodded. There were few silver on Earth still hosted by an alien body. A lot of people would breathe a sigh of relief when the last of the Silver's old host bodies finally died, and a lot of biologists would cheer in clear examination tables. Despite all the Silvers had taught mankind, despite the advances and the new perspective that came from knowing humanity was not alone, there was still a vocal minority who called for their extermination. The newer generation of Silvers hosted by human bodies were doing a lot to counter the hysteria that Michael and his brood had ignited when they arrived. Tyler felt the outline of the fresh scar on his side, a reminder of his heroics in New York. You're still feeling that shine, ain't you? Tyler's aunt asked him, misinterpreting the half-grimace on his face. She leaned forward and patted his leg. Maybe you ought to take a nap and rest up for the fun tonight. Brown family awakes can take a toll. She stood and swept his mug from his hand, then smiled down at her nephew. Ty, it sure is good to see you. Take some of the sting out of... The smile faltered, and Vida carried the cup over to the sink. Silent. Harlan's face twisted, frozen in mid-scream. Wet, ragged breathing was the only sign of life in the comatose old man. Tyler pulled a chair from the corner and sat beside the bed, watching his father. His trembling fingers held his father's reading glasses and his corncob pipe. He breathed in the smell of the wadding, remembering the Harlan Brown that used to be. Long before the Silvers had helped him make up his mind, Tyler had spoken his mind to his father. He remembered Harlan's scowl as he tapped out that very pipe, how he'd scratched his eternal gray stubble, fixing his son with a glare of displeasure. I can get you a job in the mill with your brother, Tack. Now I don't want you mixed up with the army. That's government. Pacing at the foot of the porch and looking up at his father, Tyler forced himself not to shout, Because I hate it here, and stuttered through the list. Better pay, a university education, a chance to travel, the only way he'd known for a poor man to get out of the hills. Harlan unclenched his jaw long enough to jab it at his son with the stalk of that pipe. Horseshit! You don't need to pick up a gun to prove yourself a man! 
Tyler could picture the hard look on his father's face, as if they'd just rehearsed the much-revisited argument yesterday. But now, with no stake in winning their lifelong argument, Tyler could now see past his father's anger and bluster, and into his fear. You were afraid of losing me, Tyler realized as he stumbled towards sleep. Why couldn't I see that before, Papa? His final day at home, before leaving for boot camp, Vida came bearing baked goods to see her favorite nephew off. Tyler sat on the porch, waiting for his father and brother, while Vida made feeble excuses. Can't let the fields go to weed this time of year, boy, but I'm sure they'll be along soon. They weren't. Aunt Vi alone made the trek over the hill to catch a ride to the highway in the back of a neighbor's pickup, and waited with him for the green bus full of green recruits, and hugged him tight when it was time to go. They're proud of you, boy. And they surely do love you, she promised him. But to Tyler, the words rang hollow. Tyler sat in the chair, half asleep, his head in his hands to muffle the sound of his father's wet, strangling breathing, and remembering leaning on the tailgate of a black suburban, flashing emergency lights and painting the sky. He remembered the praise of the other escorts and soldiers, remembered being surrounded by mirror-shaded security agents. He looked down at his bandaged hand and the stab wound on his chest the paramedic was taping up. Through a haze of pain and medication, he heard the man's Bronx-accented praise. Good job, Lieutenant. You're going to get a hero's welcome when you get home. The words opened a deeper wound, one that never healed. The chore of the hated, Tyler murmured to himself as he wrung out the cloth and ran it across his father's brow. Michael walked alongside Tyler as he patrolled the fence perimeter of the base. The muffled shouts of the protesters out of sight, mobbing the front gate, filled the cool air. They also ground on Tyler's nerves, but didn't seem to perturb the silver as he smoothly executed tricks with a bright neon pink yo-yo. Doesn't their hate ever get to you, Michael? Tyler asked. Without interrupting his fluid cast of the toy, he looked over his shoulder at the halo of bright lights in the skies above the gate, hidden by the bulk of the Silver's living complex. He shook his head. They only think they hate us, Lieutenant. If I were to fear them in return, that would just be two wrongs. His eerie, monotone voice carried sureness, as if Tyler had asked him the time of day, or to recount what he'd eaten for lunch. They can't admit to themselves the truth, so they hide in the hate. Tyler thought about that. He knew from way back most people willing to throw a brick weren't long on thinking. So, what's the truth they can't admit? Michael's eyes, swimming with silver, met Tyler's. How frightened they are. How powerless they feel. Tyler accepted the role of student in good humor. He was used to it. Still... There must be days when you want to whistle for one of your city ships to come and pull you out of this zoo. Michael laughed then, <laughs> a genuine ringing sound, as he reverently tucked the top of the yo-yo string in between its wooden halves before depositing it in a jacket pocket. There will always be hate based on color, choice of religious comforts, choice of fetish. I am no more feared or hated than any other variation of the human shell. It's the chore of the hated to dispel the fear they conjure. At once walking beside Michael and sitting at his father's deathbed, Tyler's heartache grew deeper, finally understanding the distance Harlan put between himself and his son for what it was. <coughs> Blue's bark stirred Tyler. The thunder from the muzzle of a gun propelled him from his chair and out the door. Tyler was clear-headed and alert before the echo of the shotgun blast faded from the air. His feet pounded quickly through the cabin and down off the porch. The yard was an angry tableau, lit by firelight and torches. The Brown family and friends were whispering statues around the fire, watching two very large men crouching defensively between two fallen men and facing a third. Tyler made his way through the crowd cautiously, his eyes struggling to decipher the identities of the men by the poor light of the fire. On one side of the flames were the two big men, one wielding a knife and the other a pitchfork. Across from them, another man walked slowly backwards, away from the crowd, his face too far from the flames to be made out. His two assailants followed, 
cursing and goading. Tyler eased past Uncle Hugh and one of his nephews, leaning beside the fallen man. Blue growled fiercely. He was a big man, tall of frame but all gone to fat. With a start, Tyler recognized the middle of the chase boys who had recently burned themselves out of their home. Byron, that was him. What's going on here? Tyler roared, his command voice clear and strong. The nearest chase boy, Charlie, flicked his head from his intended victim and over to Tyler. He giggled nervously, jowl shaking. <laughs> well, if it isn't the little stooge come home at last. Charlie was a year older than Tyler, a vicious bully to whomever got in his way. The giggle didn't carry its sadistic pleasure of old, though. It bordered on terrified, as if it was all the bully could do to keep his nerve. Stay out of this, soldier boy. Charlie continued, pointing the knife he wielded meaningfully in Tyler's direction now. It, it wanted at Byron, squeaked the youngest chase boy, Frankie. Tyler saw he held the pitchfork across himself, more for protection than attack. His eyes flicked back to Charlie, assessing him as the immediate concern. It's my father's wake, Charlie, he said reasonably. This isn't the place to settle old grudges. Put the knife away. Shut up! Charlie laughed hysterically. <laughs> shut up! Shut up! You're the one that brought that thing here. Maybe you're trying to get your monster a nice new home in little old Harlan. I don't know. Tyler's eyes shifted over to track the shape across the flames, which lifted its hand in greeting, light shimmering on its skin. Frankie squealed in terror at the sudden movement and charge, pitchfork raised for a killing blow. Time slowed and the identity of the third man dawned on Tyler. Too far away to intercept, he watched Frankie Chase charge the silver, his large hands thrusting the pitchfork forward. A kind smile played on the silver's lips as his small frame twisted to the side. Quick hands deflected the tines of the pitchfork, then wrenched the weapon from the corpulent hillbilly's grip. Off balance, Frankie fell. Demonstrating amazing speed, the smaller man turned Frankie's speed and weight against him and flipped him to the ground on his back. Charlie screamed, the last of his control broken, and lunged to help his brother. Frankie! No! No! Tyler reached him before he'd closed on his brother in the silver and twisted his knife wrist backwards. Charlie yelped as the knife fell from his useless hand. He pushed his forearm into Tyler's chest, knocking the wind from him. Foolishly, not used to a thinking opponent, the enraged Charlie pushed the attack. Tyler pulled Charlie's leading arm around until it was behind his back and pushed it painfully up into his shoulder blade. Without incident, Tyler forced the much larger man to his knees. Any struggling caused shrieks of pain and soon Charlie fell silent. His backside falling on top of knees in submission. He moaned, looking up at Tyler as if he, too, were from another world. Easy, Charlie. Easy, Tyler said, patting the man's shoulder. Blue came closer, smiling around his panting tongue, as if to congratulate Tyler on a job well done. Running feet came from behind the house. Tyler heard a log fall from his brother's grip, and looked up to see Tom's mouth open at the sight of the three chase boys incapacitated, and his brother holding Charlie down effortlessly. Tyler, what? His eyes froze as they fell upon the other new arrival. Michael walked up to Tyler's side, executing a half bow to Tyler himself, then another directed in respect to the Brown clan. Small flecks of silver on Michael's cheek and throat glinted in the firelight as he spoke and smiled. I apologize for intruding on you all with this display. He smiled down to Tyler much less formally. Thank you for your assistance, Lieutenant. Your arrival was timely as always. Tyler let go of Charlie, who sunk to the ground, hid his eyes and moaned. <laughs> Large gouts of silver oozed from holes in Michael's shoulder, and Tyler realized the alien had been shot. He looked around and saw his entire family frozen in place, every eye locked on the viscous silvery tendrils weaving in and out of shotgun-riddled flesh like wriggling worms. And there it was, the smell he'd hoped to leave behind, far from Shooter County. Warm, a scent like baking bread, but unmistakable, even when disguised by smoke from the fire. The smell of death. 
Come dawn the next morning, Michael still sat outside by the fire, while a heated debate raged inside the ramshackle brown house. There's no damn way that thing's setting foot in this house. Uncle Hugh blew foul cigarette smoke out his nostrils. You know how your Harlan feels about those things, Vi. Tom had disappeared into Harlan's room after Tyler and Uncle Hugh had seen the chase boys off their property, wisely keeping the chase's knives, shotgun, and pitchfork. He hadn't emerged in the hours that followed, while Vida and Hugh paced around Tyler, frightened out of their wits by the night's events. For God's sakes, this is Shooter County, boy, not New York or Washington. Uncle Hugh whispered, as if afraid of insulting the being he would not let enter Harlan's home. Come tomorrow, there's going to be a lynch mob outside our door. Tyler stood up angrily and Hugh backed away, his recent display of fighting skill alienating Tyler all the more from his uncle. Lynch mobs? Jesus, how could Shooter County still think like this? Tyler wondered, but he knew it was true. Price City was only 40 miles away, the interstate only 15, but everyone here was still scared of what lay just down the road. He paced to the sink, leaning his weight against it and breathing deep to calm himself. Michael wouldn't hurt a fly unless attacked, Hugh. It's not in him. Uncle Hugh collected his hat and coat from the rack by the door and quickly dressed. You believe what you want, boy, but those silvers ain't natural. Come now, Vida. Tyler's uncle waved his sister to follow him. Vida crossed her arms. Hugh, you old fool. What do you think? That critter's some kind of vampire come to suck our brother's blood? He's Tyler's friend, and that's why he's here. She gazed thoughtfully at Tyler. Don't you see it yet? Ty's got himself in a lot of trouble for coming here. That's what this Silver's visit's all about, ain't it so, boy? Tyler blinked at her, amazed. You're still the smartest lady I've ever known, Aunt Vi. He smiled weakly. She nodded, satisfied, and walked to the screen door. Pushing it open, she shook her head sadly at her brother. Go on home, Hugh. I'll be along directly. Hugh bristled, snapping his head from his nephew to his sister before storming out. Vida eased the door quietly shut behind him. Tyler joined her and watched his uncle skirt nervously past the fire pit, where Michael sat, rubbing Blue's ears. Thank you, Vi. She nodded, near tears, the tension in her large frame obvious. It's a bloody shame folks got a hold on to what scares them so tight, tight. Your granddaddy talked the same way about... The big woman's words failed her. She waved out to Michael and smiled like a wide-eyed child when he waved back. That creature's miraculous, you ask me. Nothing to be scared of. <laughs> Vi laughed, then sniffled against her tears. Look at that mutt. Drooling over your friend out there. I've never known a better judge of character than that hairball. She put a hand on Tyler's cheek, then averted her eyes. Well, your uncle's right, Tyler, she admitted, face burning with embarrassment. Shooter County's not a good place for him. Not yet. She drew him close, throwing an arm over his shoulder and nodding, as if all outstanding issues had been settled. He'll have your bed, Tyler. You'll watch over your father tonight? She withdrew her arm and stepped out of the door as the first droplets of rain began to fall. Turning, still walking backward, she shouted, and I want to hear about this trouble you gotten yourself into before you run off again, you hear me, boy? Yes, ma'am. Tyler called out from the porch as Blue bounded up the steps and skittered into the kitchen as the rain started tapping the tin roof. He watched Aunt Vida wish Michael a good night. Her face lit up with a smile that Michael returned, then walked into the darkness. The silver watched her disappear into the cover of the woods, oblivious to the rain falling harder and harder upon him. Close the door, Ty. Tom stood in the doorway to their father's room, face pale. His mouth worked hard. The sounds didn't come easily. Of all the times to bring one of them here. Of all the damned times. Shivering, Tyler stepped back into the kitchen, stopping at the table and leaning heavily upon it. Pa? Tom's voice was a scratchy whisper. It'll be tonight. Tyler stepped out of his father's room at dawn to find Michael sitting at the kitchen table. 
I am sorry to have complicated your father's death, Lieutenant, he said. Tyler ignored him, stepped over the dog lying on the floor, and poured the bowl of pink water down the sink, then turned the cold tap full open. Soaking the face of cloth and wringing it out, then filling the large bowl, Tyler tried to ignore the hacking from his father's urine, squeezing his eyes shut and bowing his head. His suffering will not last. Your father will stop soon, Michael stated. Tyler didn't ask Michael how he knew. The Silvers had whole senses devoted to sensing death that the lab rats were still puzzling out. The Silvers' ability to predict illness in his fellow soldiers had scared him at first, before he got used to it, before he became grateful for it. But right then, in his dying father's kitchen, Michael's pronouncement reached inside him and made him angry. I know, Tyler growled, fighting down an uglier response. Regarding your exit from base, Lieutenant, the alien's human host's mouth informed him, you are no longer absent without leave. Then, as the damn silver so often did, Michael switched tracks in the conversation so quick as to prove his otherness once again. You have been permanently reassigned to oversee for my security. I look forward to your services. How long do you think you will need to grieve? He's not dead yet! Tyler slammed the ceramic bowl back down in the sink. Chill water lapped over his fists. I burned my career behind me to come back to... what? A brother who hates me and a father so far gone he thinks I'm still nine years old? The words came ragged now. Uh, And now I can't even say goodbye. Michael rose from his seat and opened his mouth to speak. But Tyler had opened the wound now, and he kept going, tasting salt water spill down his cheek into his mouth. Now you arrive here, a place you are not safe. So while I'm trying to get a handle on Papa... Dying, Tyler thought. Papa Papa dying. I'm supposed to think up a way to get you out of here in one piece, right? Well, I can't do that right now. The silver stood motionless in the middle of the small kitchen, the rain beating atop the tin roof, the only sound to follow his angry words. Then Michael covered the quicksilver flowing across the shotgun wound in his shoulder with both palms and lowered his head. A silver gesture not of pain, but of apology. No, more, Tyler realized. Of shame. Tyler! Tom shouted hoarsely. Come quick! The water from the dropped cistern splashed at Michael's feet as Tyler ran past. Blood. So much blood. And the smell of a sea of copper. Harlan's frail body clung too hard to life, and brittle joints cracked with the urgent need to climb out of the nearing coffin. No words escaped the mouth that had taught, cheered, and punished the two men that now attended its every misshapen sound. Then, Harlan Brown (gasps) sighed out his last breath. For Tyler Brown, no sound penetrated past that last breath. The moment his father became still, his brother's shrieks, the rolling thunder, even his own pounding heart disappeared. It's too late, Harlan's exiled son realized. The storm hid the day, and wind tore the air. Tyler climbed the hill behind the house, his senses blessedly beaten back by the storm's wrath. He was deaf to the world and his own all-encompassing sobs. The rain pelted his face as he walked into the fury, taking the storm's punishment. When the mud beneath his feet gave way, he fell to his knees, still crying. When his knees gave, he fell to his side, punching the soft ground, cursing. Too guilty and too angry for sleep, he denied its release with every blow he threw. No matter the number of times his fist pummeled the earth, it was never enough. The sliding earth and blowing wind inevitably threw the soldier back down the hill, his strength gone before the elements, if not his pain. It took more time, huddled against the woodshed, before he could make himself return to the dark house. Inside the dark kitchen, ingrained habit made him pick the spilled cistern from the floor and carry it to the counter. Tyler's hands and face burned from the force of the rain, even as his body shivered from the cold. The homecoming he yearned for would never come to pass. There would be no greeting, no reunion, no peace with his father. There was nothing for him in this house now. Incapable of making his feet carry him to either the bedroom or outside, 
indecision turned into exhaustion. Tyler surrendered to it and leaned against the kitchen chair. Slowly, sound returned. The drip of water from his soaked body. And something else. A moan from Harlan's bedroom. Tom? His brother was surely hurting as much as he was. With that thought, Tyler finally urged his beaten body forward to the open door of Harlan's room. Tyler peered inside, letting his eyes lose their focus to detect the shapes in the dark within. The figure sitting on the bed beside Harlan shuddered, one hand pressed to the corpse's chest. A mewling cry shook his form and pulled to Tyler's heart. Tom! He called to the fitfully shaking form on the bed. What? The sleepy answer to Tyler's call didn't come from the bed. Reality bent for a moment before he could place the sound and track it to the chair beside the bed. His hand batted the light switch without conscious thought. Light filled the room and seared images into Tyler's brain. Tom slumped almost unconscious in his chair, and Michael atop his father. Harlan's once again opened eyes met Tyler's, full of uncomprehending horror. His blue lips were pulled back to scream, but his mouth was full and he could not. Between the two, wet, shining, alive, writhed a cord of quicksilver, pouring out of Michael's mouth and into Harlan's. The wet, undying smell of the silver that poured out of Michael. What was the real Michael, the life force that animated its human host, reached Tyler and snapped him into action. He bounded to the bed, yanking on the slick sheets below his father's reanimated body and sending Harlan tumbling to the floor, breaking the union. In the same motion, Tyler grabbed the wooden frame of the bed and kicked his feet up into Michael's face, falling and turning protectively over his father's body. The side of Michael's face split under Tyler's foot as he stumbled backwards, and a line of silver dripped out from it as he calmly stood, hand raised, palms out. I have... Not. Weak from whatever he had done to Harlan, Michael's words and movements were slurred, warped, alien. Bastard! Tom charged the alien, slamming the intruder against the wall and driving the big hunting knife from his belt into its uninjured shoulder hard enough to pin it against the wall. Tyler found his footing and raised himself to join his brother's assault when he heard the words, No, Tack! No! Tyler heard the word, and so did Tom. The room stopped. Tyler turned to look and saw. Harlan's eyes moved from his two boys, lips curling away from yellow teeth in a vicious snarl. Time will keep that critter where it's put. Tyler fell to his knees, a stone in his throat. Pa! The old man swung thin legs over the side of the bed. Harlan Brown's sunken eyes locked on Tyler as he stood and with alien strength kicked the boy across the floor and into the doorframe, cracking the old wood with the force of his blow. Bring the devil to my home, will you? I'll put you in the ground, Tack, like I should have done years ago. Harlan slid his arms into a patched old robe. He bunched his shoulders and relaxed them with a big breath. (sighs) Pain's gone. Leaning on the bedpost, Harlan began to laugh. (laughs) Possessed by a devil, maybe. But thank the Lord, there's no pain. Tyler watched, speechless from the floor, holding his ribs where his father had kicked him. Fractured. Maybe broken. Something wrong in his lungs, too. Every breath was as wet as Harlan's had been before he died. Tell me, army brat, where do I go now? Did that son of a bitch take my ticket to heaven? Still impaled on Tom's knife, Michael's chest rose and fell unevenly. His skin had turned white, but still a whisper of a smile played upon his lips. I owe your son, Mr. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, I did nothing. Long and still training was the only thing that let Tyler struggle to his feet. He recognized Michael's stuttering and dull tone as signs of the Silver's inability to control his host's body. The trauma of being stabbed, even compounded by the kick Tyler had given, wouldn't be near enough. The alien had done something that overloaded his ability to function. Like raise the dead, apparently. Tyler shook his head to clear the pain in his ribs, 
and the shock, still dulling his thoughts like a wet canvas blanket. He watched his father move. No, swagger. He was angry and feeling a buzz, not from moonshine, but from returned health. His eyes shone with adrenaline, and whatever internal emotions were stirred by the process of coming back to life in the presence of his disowned son and the alien he thought of as a devil. But that really was Harlan Brown in there, not a silver. You thought your zombie friend would kill me? <laughs> Harlan laughed, working the thought through for himself, feeling at his skeletal ribs. I am a righteous man, he bellowed, his fist hammering at the bedpost and shattering it into a thousand splinters. Tyler swallowed, fighting his own internal emotions. His father possessed the strength of a silver. He focused again on Michael, gauging his host body's color and slowing motions. He needed help, or both silver and the body that housed him would be cold and still for good in short order. Tom turned away from Michael then, and reached out for his father's shoulder, concern on his face showing he expected Harlan to fall at any second. Harlan slammed him back on the wall beside the silver with ease, replacing Tom's concern with wide eyes and hanging open mouth. Watch that monster, boy! He's here for our souls! Harlan warned in an icy tone. But I've been ready for him. He turned to face Tyler. Been expecting you back, see? Michael's eyes were half-closed. One hand shook as he tried to raise it, palm out. I assure, assure, Mr. Brown, I have no, no, no designs on your soul. Harlan hammered Michael's face with a blurring fist, then grabbed the silver's collar and hit him again. Ah, uh, resist me! Harlan snarled, silver and spittle dripping from his mouth with the force of his blow. Before God! Another blow. I smack thee! Another blow. Some fear from Harlan's lifetime jerked his talking corpse out of the way of the spattering silver flow. Papa! Harlan whirled to face Tyler, pointing a finger. You want to tear us all down into sin with you? Want your daddy and your brother to burn in the pit with you? Harlan leapt at his youngest son, hands reaching for his neck with inhuman speed. Tyler heard his brother scream some warning, but military reflexes again moved his body before his brain could process what was happening. Sparring with superhuman creatures had honed Tyler's ability to read body language, and his father was not being at all subtle. He swept with his forearms, and all Harlan's power was diverted past his son to send him stumbling into the hall and onto the floor, snarling and spitting, incoherent with rage. Tyler pushed himself against the wall to Michael's side. Tom, on the other side of the alien, put his hand on his brother's chest when he reached for the blade in Michael's shoulders. Don't. You're killing him, Tom. He didn't do anything to Papa except... Except reanimate his corpse. Lend him a fearsome speed and power with which to fire all the small-mindedness and hate his father possessed. Nothing except bring Harlan back to life, so... Tyler's breath hitched in his throat with the realization. So... So I could say goodbye. Harlan was on his feet again, roaring. But he didn't storm back into the room. His grunts and guttural shouts disappeared down the hall, soon to be joined by the sounds of things falling or being thrown around in the kitchen. Tyler watched his brother stare out the door after their father, then turned to face Michael. It's still him. Inside. He whispered. Tyler nodded. Maybe his brother could see the truth of it, could get past his fear of Michael. Tom's eyes went to the silver, took in the fluttering eyes, ruined face coated now with the droplets that held his consciousness. The wounds were barely dripping now, and losing their sheen, turning dull gray. Harlan was at the door now, something long and misshapen in his hands. Get away from him, Thomas! I'm ready now! Gonna send him back down! His father held something like an icicle, its color streaked from white to gray along its length a nickel spike. Tyler stumbled across the floor towards Tom's silver-coated blade. He crouched low, the blade falling instinctively into his hand. He ignored the way his arm shook as he stepped in between Michael's shivering host body and his father. He's no demon. He's the same as us, except that spike is like cyanide to him. Pop, don't do this. Please, he brought you back, so we... 
So we... I won't be tempted from my reward. I loved you, boy. Tyler froze in place. His stomach lurched at the raw emotion in his father's voice. You were so smart, so good, till I failed you. Let you go wrong. He hefted the spike. Weapon enough to kill human as much as silver. Gonna make that right. Bring you with me to heaven. His gaze was one of love now, even promising death. Tyler saw in Harlan's face the thing he'd never thought he'd know for sure. His father loved him. Even as he prepared to defend Michael against that love, even as his body grew heavy and he sunk back against Michael's host. Harlan paused, beckoning to Tom. Come here, boy. Won't lose you, too. Tyler turned his head, so hard to do all of a sudden, almost as hard as breathing or keeping the knife raised. The brothers locked eyes again, both stricken dumb. Tyler would try what he could. It was his duty, who he was. Harlan had taught him that. The army had only honed his family's steel, but the outcome was certain for him and Michael. Eyes twisted with emotion, Tom opened his mouth. But Tyler gave the smallest nod he could, meeting his brother's tortured eyes. Go on, Tom. Don't you... Only one way this can go. Go on! Tom walked robotically across to his father. Harlan clapped Tom on the shoulder, favoring him with a nod, then gestured at the door. Go on! Tom turned woodenly and left the room. Harlan turned to listen to him go, and once the footsteps faded, he lifted the spike higher. He shouldn't have to watch this. Ain't it just like the good Lord to show me how to care for my family only after I've been dead? Harlan surged forward. Tyler raised Tom's blade, but his father smashed his hand hard enough to send the knife flying before slamming Tyler back against the wall. Tyler struggled, but his father waved him quiet with a wave of his hand. I know, boy, he said softly and with love. I heard everything you said while I was sleeping. You've said your goodbyes. The old man looked up into his eldest son's eyes, his own brimming with tears. You're a good son, Tyke. Just... I taught you all the wrong lessons. Harlan's hand raised up, the spike now above Tyler's heart. Wish you could have been more like your brother, Harlan whispered, stabbing with his words before he reared the spike back. Michael's arm reached past Tyler and pulled Harlan by the collar hard, smashing him into his son. Tyler felt the spike graze his arm before it smashed through the wall. Harlan struggled, punishing Tyler's body and raising a wave of black in the corners of his vision until he saw only Harlan, swearing words he couldn't make out, and weeping silver. No, the silver was crawling up his face, cresting over the eyelid and writhing inside. Harlan screamed. No! His hand reared back, the spike aimed for one last stab. When powerful hands accustomed to millwork and the blade of an axe clasped and squeezed until the spike fell free, Tom held his father more gently then, when Harlan began to sag. Tyler's eyes betrayed him, winking closed even as his father's did, for the last time. He may have dreamed the words. Goodbye, son. The first leaves of the season were falling when Tyler left his father's house for the last time. The morning sun just cleared the top of the hill, and Michael was greeting Aunt Vida at the foot of it. She handed him a basket covered with a red and white kitchen towel and waved for Tyler to join them. He did, with Blue at his side. Got some fresh blueberry muffins here for your trip, Ty. Brought some for your friend, too. Says he eats just fine. Tyler laughed and pushed Blue's snuffling nose away from the muffins in Michael's hand. Michael gave a deep bow to Aunt Vi, the same bow Tyler had witnessed the being give to statesmen and kings. This is most gracious of you, miss. The sturdy old woman cut him off with a growl. Aunt Va. Michael graciously corrected himself as Tom stomped down the porch stairs. I hope both you and your nephew Tom will visit our facility. I'm sure the lieutenant would perform better with continued contact as well. Sure he will. Tom chuckled and picked at imaginary lint on the shoulder of his brother's fatigues. A smile crept past onto his usual stony face. Somebody's got to keep my little brother in line. 
Tom's eyes darted to Michael's, then dropped. His smile faded as he made a fist, then relaxed it and offered his hand to Michael. Uh, Mr... The silver turned to Tom when addressed and shook his hand crisply. Look, I don't know how... Tom licked his lip. I'm sorry you couldn't come to the funeral and all. Lord, your hand's not as cold as I thought. Tyler watched the handshake stretch on and cherished the look of open wonder on his brother's face. Tom chuckled, shaking his head in good-natured disbelief. The morning of the funeral, Tyler had ordered Michael to sit in the ruins of Harlan's shattered home. He had been pleasantly surprised when Tom asked why the Silver hadn't come to pay his respects, but this was Shooter County. The Chase brothers and their difference-fearing small-minded ilk would be on the lookout for Michael. The last thing Tyler wanted was another brawl, this time over Harlan's casket. I'll walk you boys over to the bus, Vida said. Tom, you coming? Before Tom could nod, a high whine filled the air and a shadow moved across the brown homestead, whipping leaves from the trees. A silver, saucer-shaped ship slowed to a stop above the hill. Vida let out a shriek, and Blue made for the tree line with a yelp. Tyler didn't try to hide his grin. That's okay, Ed Vi. He shouted over the eerie whine of the craft. We got our own ride this time. Vida held her hand to her chest, as displacement from the ship's drive sent curls of gray hair whipping across her cheeks, and whipped the grass on the hill. She recovered quickly from the shock of the revolutionary craft, and began to curse as the ship settled, almost silently, atop the hill. I will await you aboard ship, Lieutenant. Farewell, Tom. Farewell, Aunt Vi. Michael bowed to each in turn and then started for the craft, turning at the base of the boarding ramp to wave before disappearing inside, blueberry muffins held reverently in both hands. Tom clasped Tyler's forearm, holding it tight. Them critters are going to get you killed, aren't they? He looked up the hill at the gleaming silver craft and slapped his younger brother on the shoulder. Well, something's got to. Go on, go make nice to your bosses so we can come visit you. Tyler hesitated, voice lost at the prospect of ending the visit. So much had changed this time. Go on, Tyk. The elder brown brother insisted in a softer tone. It won't be another six years till you see us again. Bank on that. He felt his exile end on the strength of that promise. He took a last deep breath of country air and looked around in silent farewell to the land that made him. He kissed his misty-eyed aunt, nodded a heartfelt farewell too great for words, and climbed the hill for the last time. He said goodbye to Shooter County, to the land that bore him, and to his father. His feet were solid on the hillside. The rain had been greedily swallowed and locked away. From the top of the hill, he could see Shooter County Cemetery and all the fallow land that had survived his father. Harlan Brown had been six years dead to Tyler, but for one moment, resurrected in the midst of a nightmare. Tom waved up at him and whooped. Woo-hoo! Tyler waved back, a smile blooming on his face that only Tom could make as he stepped on board, strapped in, and accepted a muffin from the alien seated next to him. Michael! Take the paper off before you eat. No, the paper. Here, let me show you. Author's Note Harlan's Wake was written almost a decade ago. I wrote the story to explore racism and fear that transcended any one generation's boogeyman, though in subsequent revisions I centered the events in the heart of America. I did this for the same reason I do most things. It felt right. More to the point, it felt honest to grow the fear of the new in an older, stunted culture close to home. The silvers are meant to be the opposite of all our human fears, something hopeful and brave, growing out of the worst rot that humanity's minds and bodies can become. In an earlier naive draft, Harlan repented and learned from his encounter in time to give his son something of the reunion he wanted so much. This reeked of fairy tale and untrue plot soup, and I struggled for months to honestly chronicle the brothers and fathers' struggle through that last torrential night together. I've still been accused of being too hopeful in this final version, but I stand by it. 
That's what I love about human beings and science fiction. Both show us darkness we wish didn't exist. And both bring us hope when we least expect it, but need it most. I'm proud of Harlan's Wake, and happy it found a second home at Doonstief, just like my disowned soldier protagonist. It's a little bit ugly, a little bit true, and it's the best reflection of fear turned to violence and betrayal I could muster at the time. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story, Harlan's Wake. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, so, Big, I I, I think the story sort of spoke for itself. I, I don't have any questions for Brian. Yeah, it's funny, because I feel the same way. I guess, I guess we can just let him go. All right, hey, thanks for joining us, Brian. Thanks for being here, Brian. Yeah, yeah. It's been great. See you guys. See you later. How many times have we done that joke anyways? <laughs> All right. So I hope you guys liked the story. I thought it was a pretty good one. This one was a... It, it's been pretty different all around this entire episode. I mean, first of all, we got Brian here on the show for us, which we've never done before. And second of all, we did not pick this story. This was something that we offered to all the producers way back when we first started doing producers several years ago. As we said, you know, if you want to be a producer and there's a story that you like, that you'd like to do, that, you know, you read somewhere else, anywhere else, you know, let us know. And we'll see if we can get the author to agree to put it on the show. And Brian's the first one that's actually taken us up on that. He, How did you come by this story, Brian? Well, I've known about John Miro through Twitter and other social networks because he's part of the community. He's he's a writer that's been pretty active. He you know, interviews other people. I've seen him around. But I didn't really know too much about him. I just knew he was that guy that did alien stories, you know, and I figured first impression, oh, he likes to write about aliens. He's probably one of these conspiracy theorists like whack jobs, right? <laughs> so I, I didn't really know what to think, but he was seemed like a nice guy. I, I just had an, an impulse to go try to read his stuff because I'm obviously producing shows and doing all the things I do pretty busy. So I, I don't read as much as I'd like to. Right. That's hard all the time. But one day, good timing on his part, I guess, I, I saw a post on Twitter where he was offering this story for free on, on Kindle. I have a Kindle Fire. I, I really like it, although the screen just died a few days ago, so I'm pissed. Ooh, that sucks. Yeah, it just went totally garbled, and I don't know. I, I hope I can replace it, but kind of annoying. I didn't realize how much I relied on it because I reach for it all <laughs> the time. I'm like, oh, right. <laughs> but he offered his story for free briefly which you know for me was oh well grab it now right because if it's free for a couple of days then it'll give me a chance to maybe read it a little bit later i know who this guy is i'd like to read his stuff at some point and then i went on a trip i was staying with a friend and i was up because of my schedule i was up super early while no one else was so i just kind of over coffee in the morning i was reading the story and it's a pretty long story uh, it was a big cup of coffee i suppose that you had <laughs> yeah it was a couple hours of me uh <laughs> waiting for other people to get off their asses but <laughs> you got enough caffeine from that cup of coffee that you didn't sleep for three days later I mean. <laughs> pretty much <laughs> <laughs> but i do remember thinking while i read it that i could hear it being acted at just the way the dialogue was written i could hear some of the scenes very vividly somebody who's been doing a lot of audio production you know you're always looking for things that are compelling to produce because you really want to be interested in certain moments or something like that mm -hmm. and with this story i just there were a few moments in there i was like man i could make that sound great i i have a feeling like i know people that could potentially act well or i can think of rich or big doing this part or whatever and doing that i was like man i'd love to produce the story it's a little on the long side but, but it's still there i didn't know exactly how long it would be I, I probably would have estimated less than the 69 minutes it turned out to be <laughs> but at the same time you know i do a lot of things i i do several podcasts i do stories for you i do hg world production you know it's not like i was looking for things to add to my plate you know <laughs> right. i just had this feeling like this is a really cool story but the only way I'm really going to have time to do it is probably if the Doonstief guys are interested. <laughs> I said, but 
it has aliens in it. <laughs> so there's a chance that they'll like it because, you know, you guys have talked about wanting more stories with that kind of a theme. So I passed it on to you and just basically said, if this isn't your cup of tea, then no worries at all. But if you like this story, I'd be happy to produce it for you. So that's kind of how it started. Yeah, I remember when you sent me that email and I'm kind of like you when I read submissions and stuff, I'll get submissions passed on to me from Nicole and stuff and I'll print them out and I'll just have them on hand so that I can just read them whenever I have a few minutes. Yeah. So kind of like you said, where you read it over coffee, except for I didn't have a gigantic cup of coffee <laughs> like you. So I sat down to read this story. You know, I read a little bit. And then I, next time I had a chance, I read a little bit. And I swear it took me like a month to read through this story because <laughs> I kept only getting a few minutes. And so it is obviously a little longer than what we generally do, although we've done long stories and we don't shy away from them um, because we like long stories. There's a tendency for you to get a lot more from a story that's longer. You can really get more into the characters and more into the action and so forth if you get more given to you were the uh, opposite of a lot of places where they're so you know they want you to have a in under this word count and stuff which yeah i don't necessarily understand the last one i did the ever dreaming verdict of plagues was probably longer but that had an obvious break point to make two right. episodes and this one the only spot was something like a little over 40 minutes in you know and it just wasn't an even break point and it wasn't even a good break point. And I was just like, uh, unless you guys had a strong urge to break it up, I kind of saw it as one episode for that reason. So it's the longest single episode for sure. <laughs> yeah, that always works for me. It took me like four months to produce the thing. It was crazy. Wow. You still there, Rish? I am still here. So, <laughs> okay. Brian, let me ask you about the production. Uh, mm -hmm. What is entailed in that four months? What is the first thing that you do? on the, the story because big and I tend to just read the whole dang thing when we're producing it yep. and then we assign voices and I do it differently than big. I don't like to go through and do pass after pass after pass. I just try to start at the beginning and when I finally finish it, I'm done. Yeah. I do a lot of passes because it's just, I guess it's the workflow that I have, but it's kind of necessary the way that I do it. I guess I start by gathering lines, which I don't do in the most intelligent way, because what I'll do is I'll cast a bunch of the roles right away, or I'll ask people and hear back. I, I almost always get a yes. And there's usually one or two little roles that I kind of have to figure out what to do with, but they're not, don't seem as important because they're not, you know, the big roles. One liner guys. One liner, even like five or six liners, but you know what I mean? It's not the major part. And, right. And I'll realize that I'm starting to receive lines from the first wave, and I haven't asked for lines from the second, like the little stuff yet. And I'm like, well, those people still take two weeks, regardless of whether it's one line or six for whatever reason. So I think if I was a little more efficient, it would be quicker in terms of getting all the lines in, like snap, snap, right? So it, there's a period of time where I'm gathering lines. And and I do so many different things that I don't get ahead with sound effects or anything like that. It's just like I get the story, I go through it, I cast it, I send stuff out, and then I work on other stuff while I wait for stuff to sort of start to trickle in, right? Once I have stuff in, then I start building it. The narration is a big key. So when I get the narration from you guys, in this case, I did it, but for a lot of stories, it's one of you. So once I get the narration in is when I can really start to plow through stuff. So yeah, I get the lines in and then... From that point, it ends up being a matter of going through and starting to... First, I line up all the lines. Like, I'll go through the whole story. I, I'll have the narration. I'll have the different actors lined up, picking their best takes or whatever. Most people give me a few takes of each line. That stuff doesn't take too long. It's just a few hours here or there. If you're doing this as a hobby, it might be you spend four hours on a Friday for a couple of weeks, and you get that part done, and then... You reach a point where, okay, now you got to start getting fancy and you got to add in the sound effects and, and think about the music and stuff like that. Sound effects can take a really long time because you can spend a long time gathering them and then you can listen to stuff and just get rid of it because it's not good. It can be frustrating. And part of it is my own personality. I could do less sound effects than I do. <laughs> <laughs> my choices are usually to try to make it sound like epic as people might say uh -huh. and i probably could 
tone it down a little bit, but I get excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I have a tendency to, I get started on it and I start putting things in. Then I was like, oh no, okay, now it needs this too. Oh, now that I've got that, it needs this other thing. And pretty soon it's over the top. I tried to be smarter with this story. I, for example, there's a lot of scenes with the dog in it just kind of appearing. And uh, I have him barking when it's mentioned that he barks, and I have him growling when it mentions that he growls. But I had thought about having like a chain rattling or something every time he passed through the room or got mentioned backing away from under a chair. But I decided that was just way too much and that probably would be more confusing than it was worth. So I just left that out. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of those things I used to do. I used to put footsteps in for people all the yeah. time. And that is so much work that it's just not worth it. And I think people got annoyed by it too. So yeah. <laughs> I stopped doing that. I, I, that's footsteps is where I draw the line. Unless there's a really, it's an important sound effect in a way. The hard part with footsteps is that if you just try to grab like uh, Freesound, which we use freesound.org a lot. If you use that, mm -hmm. you're really limited because you're pretty much whatever foot... You can change the timing of footsteps, but you're still pretty limited because there's not a ton of stuff on there. Right. You know, the only way you can do footsteps right is if you have literally like a box with different materials that you can pour into it and different shoes that you can clop, clop, clop by a microphone and get the timing that you want for each spot. And that's so much work. Yeah, you, you got to be an actual Foley person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just not worth it for full cast. There's a difference between full cast and audio drama. If you don't have to have people described coming into the room because the narrator's already doing it, then you're fine. You don't have to do that. In fact, if anything, it's going to be distracting for some people. Some people might be fine with it, but it's more likely you're going to piss people off than add to the experience. So uh, that's the thing with what we do is that we try to accentuate things, but still leave things up to the imagination. I still feel like I'm learning how to do that. I don't feel like everything I do is perfect. There are sound effects that when I listen to the final product, I'm like, ugh. That sounded great when I put it together, but now it sounded like something fell over over in the corner of the room, not not right in your face or something like that. Right. Okay, so Ryan, you narrated this story. Do you have a sort of cast list you can share with us of everybody that did all the parts? Sure. Yeah, we're supposed to do it after the story, but we totally blew it. We're already <laughs> halfway through the show, but that's all good. That's because we had your terrible joke that we had to get out of <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, so I narrated the story. Big Anklevich played the part of Tyler. Catherine Pride, who you probably heard from previous Dune Steve episodes, was Aunt Vi. Rish Outfield played the part of Tom. Tobias Queen, who's produced and acted for Dune Steve before, played Hugh. Tom Merritt played Michael, the alien. Tom Merritt is somebody who uh, is a pretty big-name podcaster who I was pretty excited to get a chance to cast into something. Cool. Larry Bailey played Harlan. Larry is a really cool guy. He um, can do all kinds of voices from kids to old people. He approached HG World, and once I saw his reel, I was, snapped him up for the next story I did. And so he played Harlan in this one. He's pretty awesome. David Robeson played Charlie, and Brian Humphrey played Frankie and Cop. Those are the two guys that do the Roundtable podcast that you guys were on recently. Oh, and awesome. I was too. I, when I was on their show, they... They were like, hey, can we act in something? <laughs> uh, also, uh, a couple of bit parts. Uh, James David Jackson uh, played Marty and David Mastin played Jack. These are people I know more commonly as Adobe and Eid. They're co-hosts of mine in my, my Epic Heels podcast. Okay. And they filled the bit parts. I think well, there was one two lines for the two parts. That's your World of Warcraft podcast? Yep. That podcast is a lot of fun, by the way. It's a hobby type thing. Gaming is pretty a pretty passionate thing for a lot of people. It's by far my biggest audience. <laughs> All the stuff I do. Well, Dune Steve is probably bigger, but <laughs> but uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> not after our special guest episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm driving them away. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, that podcast is a lot of fun, and and both of those guys do a great job with everything they do. And James David Jackson's actually an an actor in New York City and trying to get him into stuff. He played one of the AIs in the uh, Ever Dreaming Verdict of Plague. So it's him coming back. Oh, cool. You know, I, at first I gave him a great role, then I gave him two lines. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, do you find that your friends or these acquaintances, I, I, I don't know, do you find that other guys 
resent it when you ask them to do parts or are they clamoring to do parts and you're just like, okay, okay, what do you got for me now? I get pretty regular emails from people asking, like, I haven't heard from you in a while. Can I do something? Oh, okay. Um, I feel like right now I'm in a position where I feel guilty about leaving people hanging. To be honest, I see every every story that I do, every show that I do, I'm always trying to get new people in because I'm trying to sort of expand the network that I have with actors and people. That's why Veronica Belmont and Tom Merritt and people like that, I'm really excited to work with because, you know, they have big audiences and I know they can record well and I'd like to work with them. And I know that I can be sort of a stepping stone for them to kind of get into voicing in a different way than they're commonly doing. But at the same time, I have a lot of hardcore like acting people that are just kind of excited to work with me or to work on things that they know will be produced well. So I I feel like I'm trying to always balance things where I'm not leaving. It's like, oh, I haven't used this person in a year and a half and I I don't want to lose their interest, you know. So it's always kind of an ongoing thing where I'm trying to put people together. So I'm always happy to have stories with a lot of different voices in it. (laughs) Yeah, we have a similar problem on this show. We're always getting folks that listen to the show and then they're like, hey, I would love to be on the show and they'll make a reel for us and they'll send it off to us and be like, oh, they sound good. Uh, I guess we'll send their name out to the producers because these yeah. days we only do like one in six episodes ourselves. And so I'll send their name out and then, you know, it's up to the producers to pick them or not pick them. And yeah. there's so many people that I'm sure they're like, yeah, and they sent me a reel and then I want them to be in something. But, you know, now it's been a year and a half and I've forgotten even who they were, sadly. Yeah, I, I've always wanted to try to organize something where I can have a a list of people and just a clickable, this is what they sound like. (laughs) Right. You know, because I'll forget. I think the best thing people can do if they ask to be on something is make sure they send something that you can listen to. Yeah. Because if you ask to be on something and I don't have something immediately and I don't have something to listen to, I'm probably not going to seek you out because I'm always having incoming requests. Right. So for me, it's more a matter of, I'm also always ramping up quality. So for me, the quality of your audio at the beginning, like when I started working with you guys a couple of years ago, I would take anything because I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. But now I can be more selective about that stuff. Yeah. Now you're just like, I'm not using that big Anklevich's (laughs) audio. That stuff sounds like ass. Uh, okay so was that the whole cast list did you get everybody uh the only other thing to mention is that the banjo music was uh written and performed by norm sherman how did that happen i was gonna ask you about that i i know you told me or mentioned it in passing yeah it, that was arranged at balticon i was hanging out with norm and scribe who's acted for us before and we were just sort of chilling out in my room and i just asked hey do you play banjo? Because <laughs> I really need banjo for this story. Like, I haven't figured out how to do it yet. I had found some banjo music on Jamendo, which I use a lot for music. That's a, a site with a lot of Creative Commons music. But I always feel a little bit weird about using that because I know that's not necessarily what they intended it for is our kind of stories. It's okay. It's definitely Creative Commons legal and everything. But I really like the idea of having more musical control. Uh, And actually, a couple of days before that, I had actually thought about this one when I was at Balticon at the beginning and I talking to George Crabb. I don't know if you know who that is. He's a drummer for Philadelphia Funk Authority. He's got a podcast called the Geologic Podcast and he's heavy in the skeptic community. He he's a very he's got a great voice. I I definitely want to use him sometime in the future. I asked him, do you play banjo? And He's like, oh, sorry, no. You know, I was like, ah, crap. Because he was like the idea that I had at the beginning of the weekend. Like, oh, well, Uh I guess I'll just have to try to figure out what to do with that other music. And then a couple days later, I'm kind of shit-faced in my room. And and I'm like, hey, Norm, do you play banjo? He's like, yeah, dude. (laughs) Yeah, I think I've seen video of him playing it. (laughs) And uh, I was like, oh, because I'm doing a Doonesy story that needs some. And he's like, yeah, just let me know what you need. And so true to form, I asked him you know, a couple of weeks after the convention and basically gave him a rundown. And what I needed was a couple of minutes because there's this idea of banjo playing and then it gets cut off at the end, early, early in the story. <laughs> Which was one of my favorite parts because you hear the string go, Dorm! I, that's a sound effect that I added, by the way. <laughs> that wasn't in his thing. <laughs> so I had no idea what I was going to get. I was like, okay, hopefully this is something I can use um, 
you know, I trust him as a musician, but, you know, he doesn't know the story the way that I know the story. Right. And I basically told him, okay, so I want some music. It needs to be sort of creepy. It's got to be banjo music. It's got to be, at the same time, have like a sci-fi feel to it. Which, what the hell does that mean, right? <laughs> yeah, that's hard. <laughs> but the music you hear is what he came up with based on that description. And I said, there's a two-minute span. It's going to cut off pretty abruptly at the end. And then I'm going to have a lot of scene transitions. And for that, I need some sort of banjo riff that I'm going to play with the timing and have it kind of get wobbly or something like that. So just if you could give me two minutes of the audio and then a bunch of just little short things, that would be great. And that's exactly what he gave me. You'll notice that there's a lot of scene transitions. A few of them repeat a little bit. Some of them I slowed down. Basically, when I went back in time, I slowed it down. And if it went forward in time, I played it at normal speed. Or if it stayed normal in time, I played normal speed. And I just kind of mixed them up in a way. He gave me exactly how much I needed. It was perfect. I don't know if it would always work out that way, but I feel like I got kind of lucky. It it went perfect. It's It was great. I really uh, liked the effect and the feel that it gave to the show yeah i used it in the very in the early scene when it's mentioned directly that there's some music playing and then later on during an action sequence i used the same exact music i played with it i pitched it down and sort of doubled it so that it had sort of the normal plus the pitch down a little bit just to give it a little different feel because the same music is sort of like oh here's a story starting versus here's an action scene so i used it twice i thought about using it late but rejected that eventually but that's basically how it went I hope that I did it justice in how I used it. He did an awesome job putting it together. Norm is awesome. He is. He didn't have a line in the story, though, did he? No, no, he didn't act in it at all. No, he was... Okay. There was one of those guys that uh, did one of the throwaway lines or something. It did sound a little like <laughs> Norm doing one of his voices, so I was curious. That was probably uh, Adobe or Eid. <laughs> yeah. Norm's done those kind of voices fairly often on his show, so that I was like, oh, I think that was Norm there. Sweet. Awesome. Now, here's another question for you. You talked about in the cast list, you were saying that you were the narrator, and you also said that generally you don't do that. You always like drop that on to Rish or, or me to do when you produce a story for us. But I do remember way back, I think your first story with us, wasn't it His Poisoner? Was that your yeah, first that one? Was, or no, that was no, my no. first one, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was your first one. Okay, so the World of Warcraft one was your second one. It was early as well. I don't remember if it was second. Or was that even further down the line? <laughs> so anyways, your first one was His Poisoner, and you narrated that one as well. Yes. I'm, I'm sure they're very different in quality. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you feel like you've learned a lot about narrating in the intervening time? So His Poisoner, if, I, if I, I'm looking at my production list right now, it came out technically in 2009. Okay, so that's quite a while ago. <laughs> yeah. It's late 2012 now. As somebody who's been producing and directing people and doing some voice acting here and there, gotten more and more into that, I feel like I'm starting to understand what goes into being a good actor. I don't claim to be a good actor yet, but I feel like I can tell when people don't understand what it means <laughs> to do that, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. So, I mean, narrating is a little different, but... It's not as different as you might think. It's really about sounding honest and sounding like, in this case, just getting the story across in a way that had some emotion to it and had good pacing to it that you're just kind of listening to a story. And I feel like I did a pretty decent job. I mean, there are a few spots where I, honestly, I had recorded the whole thing and threw it out and did it a second time just because I didn't feel like I was really nailing it the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm kind of a perfectionist, I guess. <laughs> And the second time through, I felt like it went really well. I think it was 90% through when I got interrupted, and so I had to record the very, very end separately. Luckily, I think it isn't noticeable, but... I didn't notice. I thought I was going to get through the whole thing and <laughs> in one take, because that, that's tough. I mean, you listen to audio... I listen to a lot of audiobooks now, like through Audible, and uh, you can tell when new chapter starts, oh, he did that on a different day. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's not even new chapter. It's just new sentence. Yeah. yeah. You know? You'll be like, oh, that's the paragraph where he ran out of breath. Yeah. They're just going, and then suddenly the quality, the t t everything in their voice just changes a little bit. The, yeah. I don't know what causes that, because you know that they're recording probably in the exact same studio from day to day too yeah but professional voice actors i 
think they'll say they record something like eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that the end of one day to the beginning of the other isn't noticeable. (laughs) Well, yeah, I guess that's true. Their voice is probably much rougher after eight hours. Then they get some sleep and all of a sudden it's back to fresh. I can't even imagine doing it that long. I get a few hours in and I'm good. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. I think some of the longest things we've done, like Cast the Demon Shadow, I think... I want to say that we did that one all in one sitting, I think, but it was hours. Like by the time we were done, it was trying to think of a good comparison to what it felt like. I don't know. It's like you go underwater and you hold your breath for a really long time and then you come out and you're like, "Ah, ah," or you just like run a, a long run, whatever, you know, a long run for me is a short run for most people, but you know, you finish and you're just like, oh, and that's what I felt like by the time we finished that cast a demon shadow story I, i've got a good example your wife recently demanded you give her another child <laughs> and by the time that ordeal was over i remember you called me and you're like whoa whoa don't think i'll ever be doing that again whoa <laughs> <laughs> anyway it's just kind of like that you know going for more than an hour or so at a time is just difficult me and rish will do when we get together and we record our episodes and our episodes run really long sometimes but usually we're also just sitting on kitchen table chairs, so they're not the kind of chairs that are made to sit in for long periods of time. And we have to go and take a walk for a while just to get back to fresh enough to be able to go again and read more stuff or talk about Batman or whatever. Eight hours of narrating has got to be insane. Yeah, I think it comes down to when you do it regularly, you start getting into a routine, you learn how to do it, but... Man, it seems so foreign when you're just starting out. It seems like a place so foreign. Chalupa for you, Big. (laughs) Ah, stop it. (laughs) Back on topic, guys. So, Brian, the voice of Michael, the alien, the silver, how did you decide how you wanted him to deliver those lines? And how did you decide whether you were going to do some kind of effect or, uh, you know, what what ideas did you have on that? That's a good question. I, I asked him specifically to be monotone because it is described as being that way in the text. I thought really hard about doing some pretty crazy effects on it, and I did play around quite a bit. But in the end, I kind of came to the conclusion that these aliens are controlling humans or human bodies in a way that... They're not supposed to sound so different that you couldn't tell they were human, but something needs to be unusual about them. Right. Basically, that's kind of how I approached it. So I did play around with EQ and and a little bit of stuff on, on his voice, but I didn't play around with it too much. I just pretty much took what I got in that case. It's tough because he's somebody I had never worked with before. So, you know, if I had been in a studio with him, we might have tried it several different ways or something like that. But he's a very articulate guy. He's a lot of audio experience. So I was pretty happy with what I got. I was able to place it in there. I think there was one retake I had to ask. It's embarrassing because it was like three months later. (laughs) Oh, I missed a line. (laughs) You know, I didn't notice till now. Sorry. Yeah, I hate that. So he sent that in and, and I was worried for a little bit because a lot of his stuff was, for whatever reason, the signal was pretty low. And then on the retake, it was really loud. Um, but when I balanced everything, I don't think it was noticeable, but that character was, was tough. I, I just, I liked the monotone that he brought. I think it could be done in a lot of different ways, but I don't know. What do you guys think about it? Well, it's something that jumped out at me because the story was so long that you don't hear an alien speak until it's two thirds of the way through or at least half. And so I kept waiting because I, I, on the dead of Tetramana, which dropped a little while ago, I struggled with how I was going to make Big's voice sound like he was a reanimated corpse. And right. and I knew that that's what the aliens were, the silvers were. And so I thought, ooh, I wonder how Brian's going to do a reanimated corpse on this. Mm-hmm. And and then when he spoke, I was like, oh, okay. So it just sounds like a guy that doesn't have an accent that speaks like pleasantly and, and he's calm and, and very little inflection. Yeah. So I, I think it worked, especially when there is the line that says the monotone there. Yeah. That description was sort of what drove it for me. Like – I, I might have had more creative flexibility, but I needed at least in that line for it to be that way. And I think it works because I think it felt unnatural to a certain degree. The fear is that with something that's so monotone that it comes across as, oh, this guy couldn't act because he was being monotone. And I don't think that Tom Merritt has any acting deficiencies. I think it was just that I asked him to do a very strange kind of a role. So I hope it came across well in that regard. But 
Yeah, I think it worked out well. Unlike what Rish was talking about with the reanimated corpse, in the case of Tetramana, the reanimated corpse is supposed to be creepy and wrong and e- twisted. And, and like John said in the author's note, these silvers were supposed to be like the embodiment of everything that's good rising out of corruption and stuff. So it really wouldn't work to have him be like, I am an yeah, alien. Yeah. yeah, it was never going to be sort of a sinister voice. It might have been more foreign. Is more just strange i could have done something that just made it clear like immediately that this is just weird without necessarily being sinister but i decided it should sound human but just not necessarily have the human qualities of of a discussion which is effectively monotone (laughs) right and then for the big group of characters all the southerners was it challenging for you to keep the accent straight to keep them all sounding similar I don't know how well I did at that because I'm horrible at accents. <laughs> Basically what I said, I used Walking Dead as a guide. I told people if if you can do Walking Dead accent, aim for that. But I, I did oh, have... Oh, the show with the British guy as the lead star. <laughs> 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 like, for example, Harlan, I told him, uh, do Herschel from The Walking Dead was my advice to him in terms of what kind of voice to do. And this is a guy with a lot of voice experience, so he could do a lot of different voices. And he did a... a amazing job but i would tell people you know i'm thinking atlanta walking dead type of accent but i'm not too picky so just you know give it your best i think at one point one actor said well okay i'll give you that but this other person has a tennessee accent and blah 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 and i was like whatever <laughs> <laughs> i can't tell the difference so yeah i'm that way too it's <laughs> like whatever he's southern it's all that matters right i think it might have been tobias who knew the difference i don't remember uh, yeah but, uh, rish asked he wanted to make sure that our accents were in line with everybody else's. And, and he asked you if you could send us out a sample, if I remember right. And you yeah. sent us Harlan's voice. Exactly. When when people ask for voices, I sent it out. But at the same time, it's sort of a family reunion story. So people could be out in different parts and really pick up different accents. So there's an argument there. Don't have to all, it's not like they all live together all the time. So <laughs> I don't know how well we did in matching them up, but uh, at least we, we have no excuse. To be honest, for me, my, my thing is that it's more about getting the emotion mm-hmm. than a specific accent. The accent tells you something about the character, but the emotion is something that if it's not there, it's just it's a problem. Yeah, sometimes people get all up in arms. You know, you never know whether it works or not. Way back when we did a story, the... Lost Boy of the Ozarks, we did the story. and mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that one. I think for the most part, I think people just talked with a regular. We didn't do any accents, but one person did do like a, a southern sounding accent. And somebody who I think they must have lived right where that story took place or something was all upset. They heard the story and they're like, wow, can't believe that you just <laughs> did this generic crappy southern accent when it's supposed to sound different and... We're just like, sorry, we did our best here. It was a free podcast after all. Yeah, that's tough. You can't please everybody. (laughs) But at the same time, you and I hate to hear stuff like that because it eats us up. And I don't know about you, Brian, but when you listen to old episodes that you've produced or old HG Worlds or anything like that, and you notice something that you could do better now, does it eat you up inside? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that you want it to be an honest performance and you can when you can sort of see the cracks <laughs> it's frustrating because you know that when you listen to something you did a few years ago and you hear problems that you didn't know then you realize that those problems were probably obvious to everyone then <laughs> except you <laughs> so you kind of but you chances kinda... are they weren't man uh, because how many people sit and listen to this in high quality audio with headphones and no distractions and can listen to, oh, hey, that's that same sound effect they played three and a half minutes ago. <laughs> we notice it because we did it. And we go, oh, you could hear the cricket go three chirps in a row again. Shoot. But I don't know that other people pick up on that stuff because they're, they're, they've they they're never heard the story before. Hopefully they're being carried by the narrative and they don't notice any inconsistencies or any errors or any Welsh accents where there were supposed to be Manchester accents and things like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a funny thing about that. And I kind of had to just come to a for this, you know, I'll produce it for the people that are going to hear it in the really nice conditions so that hopefully they'll hear the thing that I did and dig on it or whatever. But I assume that most people won't. And if they hear anything, well, then that's cool, too. At least they got some of it. 
you know, everybody gets a different level. I mean, some person might be listening to the story while they're mowing the lawn and they're probably hearing none of the sound effects and they're lucky to hear all the lines. So you never know. And you just got to make it as best as you can and then just not worry about the people that don't hear your yeah. footsteps that you added or something stupid like that. Yeah, my general policy is to make it sound as good as you can for someone with a good set of headphones, but make sure that your compression is pretty high, meaning that there's nothing that's too quiet. Right. And one thing you said about the emotion being more important than the accent, Big, was it hard? You did a lot of the heavy lifting in the acting area on this one. And was the crying hard to do? Was the accent hard to keep constant when you're adding emotion to it? Yeah, you know, I was listening to it and I, I think there were parts where I had more accent than other parts. Um, and maybe that was just because some lines were much shorter than others. And so you don't get a chance to really throw in something that gives you a obvious, oh, yeah, he's got that accent. Because I didn't realize, I think at first as I was listening to it, that I had an accent until I got a longer speech. It is a little difficult. The one good thing that I've found about acting for podcasting is nobody sees your face. Oh, thank goodness. Nobody <laughs> knows how you really are. You just got to make the sound of it. So when I'm crying, it's easy to do. It's not like people that act on TV that have to summon tears and all that kind of stuff. They have to think about when their dog got run over in front of them or something like that so they can cry. I can just go... <laughs> <laughs> and it passes as crying, which is really handy because I had to take acting classes when I was at film school and stuff like that. And I did take acting classes in high school. And one of the first comment that I got after every time I did something in my acting class in high school was, yeah. Yes. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Can I have your number? Are you single? <laughs> Will you sleep with? Right? One of those three. No, the, the third one, which was most common was, yeah, that was pretty monotone. Every that was what I got every single time was yeah oh yeah you you sounded really monotone when you did that and so you know I, I don't feel confident in my acting abilities after doing this for years I've been able to get much more comfortable I still probably wouldn't be very confident in acting in front of a camera no I'm not either and I've acted professionally for years and years once you turn on the camera then I start to worry about how crappy do I look is anybody going to buy me with this girl oh all these little things creep in but when we're just doing our voices I could be anybody right I could look like anything you could be the guy that when you're done with your scene everybody's asking uh, what your number is and if they can go out with you and stuff you know it, you could be the huge football star or you can be the little nerd doesn't really matter you could be a girl if you had to. We usually don't go that way because uh, we like it to be more realistic. But, yeah, you could be the 70-year-old man, which you've got a great voice for doing that one all the time. And so that's a good thing about acting on podcasts that I really like. It makes me seem like a much better actor than I really am. Well, I thought you did a pretty awesome job for this guy. I just remember putting it together and thinking, man, big nailed it. Well, that's... Nice to hear. I don't know if I agree with you because, of course, I hear it and I go, oh, I blew it. But uh, that's just the way it is. I think everybody's going to doubt themselves much more. No, I, I think you did a good job. Brian, you've heard me introduce you or introduce a story that you've produced a bunch of times. You've probably produced as many or more stories for the Doonstief as I have at this point. And I don't know I, about that. No, I think you have, man, because I've cut so far back and I – always say that what Brian does is, you know, he grabs a story that's going to be the most challenging or the most difficult, you know. He, he grabs the hard one, whereas most people grab the, oh, that one looks like I can be done really quick. Is that true? And what was the biggest challenge in Harlan's Wake? Let's see. I'm not intimidated by the kinds of challenge. I'm not looking for the simplest one, that's for sure. I'm looking for something that is interesting because I want to try something new. I want to learn from it. You guys have been something of a guinea pig for me in that regard. I'm self-taught as an audio producer. When I started producing for you guys, you know, in 2009, I had absolutely no experience. And I feel like right now that I could do things professionally if I wanted to. I feel like I'm pretty much there. There are definitely still things to learn, but I think my understanding of what's needed is there. The things that I deal with right now are more limitations of the Creative Commons media where I have to deal with audio quality from voice actors or I have to deal with sound effects that are not costing me money, things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think from a technical standpoint that I have any limitations at the moment. So 
that's kind of where I feel things are right now. I feel good about that. Um, so when I pick a story, it's just something that I'm passionate to work on. Like I either really like the story or there's something in it that I really want to do. That's about what it comes down to. Was Harlan's Wake harder than ever dreaming Verdict of Plagues? What has been the hardest one that you've done? Both of them were hard. <laughs> uh, I think the hardest part, hardest is, is hard to quantify, but one of the hardest parts about Harlan's Wake was there's a lot of like people getting punched in the face, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And uh, sound effects for that is, are tough. And I had some sound effects at first that I'm very glad to have gotten rid of that were kind of cartoony. And the ones that I used in the end, I think are better. Every time I listen to it, I still feel like tweaking it, though. I mean, it's just me, but... Yeah. The punch-in-the-face sound effect is really hard because cartoony ones are what people will recognize as a face punch sound. Yeah. And a real face punch sound, people would just... That, that didn't... It sounded like nothing. Exactly. You kind of got to <sighs> gotta get in between somewhere. That's, that's the hard part. Yeah. It's kind of like that time when you did Dark Detour for us and you had the part where the ship blows up in space and you're like, well, yeah. there's no explosion sound in space. So you didn't put an explosion sound on. Yeah. And then I went in and added it because we're like, boy, that was weird. There was no explosion sound. Yeah. <laughs> and so has, you have to walk that line too where, you know, okay, this is cartoony, but people will know that that's actually somebody being punched in the face. And this is what it would really sound like, but people will not know what that is. Yeah. And I think you made the right decision there. I think it sounded good. I just was being a stubborn physicist. <laughs> <laughs> well, and for the uh, UFO sound, that sounded... Mm -hmm like something from our childhood like i as soon as i heard that i knew it wasn't a jet i knew you know what i mean mm -hmm. and when you describe it as saucer shaped and all that i was like oh of course well that's what a flying saucer sounds like <laughs> right yeah the flying saucer landing i felt like i had an advantage because i got that sound effect from the post meridian players who regularly do science fiction shows in Boston with Foley effects. And so I was able to get handed off a few ready-made flying saucer effects. And I, I sort of had an ongoing hum afterwards, but the actual kind of landing sound that I had, you know, I played around with pitch and EQ a little bit just so it wasn't their effect verbatim. But yeah, I felt lucky. I, I, I knew some sci-fi experts who had already worked out that problem. <laughs> Were you done with that, Brian? Did you answer the question yep. about the spaceship? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. And a lot of times when it's just Big and me, we'll talk about what we responded to in the story or the themes or something like that. And for me, I have an uncle and he was raised Mennonite. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's essentially Amish and, and they shun technology and, and, and things like that. And my Uncle Len would always question him about things because my Uncle Len is a big believer in all these things like abductions and aliens and possessions and ghosts and hauntings and things like that. And one time I was there when they were having a big conversation and Len said, well, how do you explain all these people describing the, the aliens the same way or their crafts the same way? And my uncle said, it's simple. They're demons, Lenny. <laughs> and for some reason that made the biggest impact on me. I was probably 11 or 12 and I still hear him say, they're demons, Lenny, all these years later. And that was his answer for that, mm -hmm. you know, is that the devil had sent these images or whatever to confuse man or, or I, I don't uh, to do these things. And I, that resonated with me through the whole story with Harlan and uh, that's their interpretation of these creatures. And, and how do you convince somebody that they're not? Yeah. Except for to spend time with them like Aunt Vi did and see, wow, these are their people, too, even though they're not people. People, per se. Thank you. You stretch it out and it makes a different word. That I really responded to and, and the just the, the beauty of science fiction. I think the author said so in his note is that you can have it be about something else. Yeah. You can have it be about racism or homophobia or religious clashes but because it's aliens we're all able to to look beyond that beyond whatever our whatever our petty differences are and just associate it with whatever our issues are or what i i, I don't know I, I, that's something that i always loved on star trek maybe not the episode where it's like i am black on the left side and and white on the <laughs> right side of course i'm better but at the same time you were able to say things that you couldn't say on other shows and, they, you know, and the censors didn't grab those sort of things because it's not overt. 
And I, that was something that I, when they were talking about lynching and, and you know, I, I just, yeah, suddenly my mind went to a different place of, oh, that could also be about this. I remember thinking while producing it that if this was reality, I would be fascinated to learn whatever they could teach us, right? That That's where my brain would be. But it's also clear to me that there would be a lot of people who would instantly demonize them. I, I don't see any way to avoid that. It's unfortunate. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I'd be going, wow, can they teach us to fly out to space too? And (laughs) I want to be part of that. But yeah, there would always be those people. Rish and I actually wrote a story together last year that was kind of along those lines where aliens arrived on Earth and there were were a great number of people who were just like, screw you aliens, get out of here. We don't like you. Yeah, it was a similar story to this in that kind of way. It's just, you know, somebody seeing beyond those kind of things and stuff. Now, with this story, the author was saying in his author's note that he's been accused of being too hopeful in his final version. You know, he's just like, I don't care. I stand by it. That's the way I uh, want it to be. I kind of felt that way myself when I was reading it. You know, you you get... That it was too hopeful? Yeah, it was a little... you, You have that end scene where... The silver reanimates his father, and his father comes up, and he's just like this enraged, hateful monster that's just going nuts and he's going to kill everybody that isn't ones that he wants to keep around. The alien and his son are now going to be killed by him, and he's got super strength, and, you know, he can't be reasoned with, he can't be changed. So they managed to defeat him. Then, then the very next scene is him and his brother, and they're like, "Hey, we're happy, and we won't wait six years until we see you next time." I, I couldn't understand what it was that made Tom suddenly decide that Tyler's a okay, and I'm glad that he was around. I mean, what was it about this experience of having his father come back to life and turn into a raging monster for a bit? Well, maybe he was able to see the ugliness that his father represented. I mean, because. Now you had the excuse of saying, well, this isn't really dad. And you could take a step back and go, wait, maybe maybe that's how dad always was. And he sided with his brother instead of his father. And that was the change that he needed to get past all of his prejudices. I I, I don't know, Brian. Yeah, I, I think you have. I, my impression, uh, I heard a comment from him. I don't remember where I heard it, but about the idea of him sort of revising or changing. Because I hadn't heard the author's note till today. So... Uh, But in his mention of the story in the past, he had said something about not liking the initial ending or something. And and I always had the impression that it meant that somehow while he was under the control of the alien, that Harlan must have in some way said, oh, son, you're right. I'm not, you know, I've been wrong all this time. And I, I, I don't think that it was ever realistic for him to change his view. He still at the end was like... I heard you, I love you, but I'm still going to kill you. <laughs> right. It's kind of like I'm still going to be, you know, his hatred was still going to drive him to do something ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I, yeah, there's a twist at the end, not a twist, but a sudden change in mood at the end, I agree, where the brother has kind of glommed on. But I, I think it might be partly because Harlan was so clearly out, out of it after he was resurrected. He was just so clearly willing to kill his own family over his beliefs that that might have turned the tables for the brother. It might have been interesting to try, uh, and this is me who's not really a good writer giving writing advice to somebody who's got a career, but <laughs> it might have been interesting if Tom in that uh, somehow sacrificed, not sacrificed himself, but, you know, did something to save the alien and his brother before... The alien eventually managed to subdue the father so that you see his change of heart before the next scene comes and he's had the change of heart. I don't know. He sort of did, though, because the last moment, if I recall correctly, the last moment Tom comes in and sort of is involved in the final altercation and makes it so that his brother doesn't get killed. I'd have to look at the wording to see exactly how that happened because I don't remember. Maybe it flew over my head. Maybe I missed yeah, it somehow. I think it was quick. I think it was really quick. So so he was told to leave the room and he comes back. And I think when he comes back that he... I think he, he stays um, the father's hand. Yeah, exactly. And, oh, well, then we can cut that whole bit that I said <laughs> out of the uh, whole episode because I must have missed it. I, yeah. Do you really want me to cut it out? 
I don't know. If... Well, to be honest, I didn't realize it till like the fourth time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, see, I didn't so get to listen to it through as many times as I normally would if I was producing a story. So easier yeah. to miss things like that. It could also be just that in violence, you get out some of that anger and that frustration and, and, and then the impotent rage that a guy sometimes has. You know, you'll have two brothers that resent one another and then they fight and then the resentment goes away. It just it, it was a way of exercising it. You have Captain Picard finally standing up to his brother who had bullied him his whole life. And then suddenly they love one another. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. That's one of my favorite next gen episodes. But it, 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 I remember it being like that when, you know, you'd be with a cousin or whatever. And maybe there was resentment that was just always under the surface. And when it finally came out, then you could get past it. Or even better than fighting each other, if you fight something else together, you kind of get that bond. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Sorry, was that too geeky? Brian, did I <laughs> alienate you there? Dude, that's like the most <laughs> memorable episode for me. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to be in this room or not. <laughs> I'm going to go play some sports now and you know, beat up a minority. That's right. I need to rinse this geek stink off of me here. It's uh... <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we've talked for a long time, and uh, our episodes are always long, so we're not going to apologize for it. But it's probably time that we bring it to a halt and uh, let you folks all go your separate ways. There's a million and one things we could have talked about on here, though. Right. And Brian had the opportunity, what, to sit down with the author, with John, and talk to him and, and ask questions? Yeah, I actually talked to him before I had done all that much of the production. Just sort of talked about casting a little bit for a full cast making of, which I'm still at the moment producing. So <laughs> but I can't tell you what's in it beyond that. But yeah, I interviewed him and we talked about the story a bit. It's kind of funny because since that time, I've met him at Balticon and I kind of know him pretty well in person now, but I didn't yet at the time of the interview. <laughs> that's just how it goes sometimes. Cool. And so that's going to be on your show coming up. Yeah, I'll release it around the time this episode drops and I will... So next year? <laughs> <laughs> I will do some making of in terms of sound effects and... and some of the choices I made in the story uh, and hopefully have a little bit with you guys as well. And that should be a really fun episode. All right. That sounds cool. So if you are not a full cast podcast subscriber, you ought to go and check it out. So you, I'm sure there'll be more Star Trek references as well because, uh, <laughs> you know, he's planning on having Rish on board. So the fun will continue. Cool. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'd like to thank Brian Lincoln for taking time out of his busy day to hang out with us for an hour or so and talk. And uh, also, especially, we never get to do this very often in person, but thanks for producing the story for the show. Uh, my pleasure, guys, as always. You've produced a ton of them, man. And have you ever come close to throwing your hands up in the air and say, this is it, this is the last one? No. <laughs> no, I, I enjoy it. Because we've had a lot of guys do that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but my motivation for doing it, like, there's a certain joy I get in contributing to something that I admire, which I don't mean to be too cheesy, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I really love what you guys do, and to be able to contribute to it, I'm proud of that, and I don't see myself wanting to stop. Well, cool. We, we'd love to have you. You've been a great asset to the show. Every time a story that you've done comes up, we're like, oh, sweet, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> so I try. We've got that. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. I've been Big Anklevich. And Rish Outfield. And Brian. <laughs> and we'll see you guys later. <laughs> thanks for listening. Good night. If you enjoyed today's episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, please drop by iTunes and give us a five-star rating. Yeah, right. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two.
I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about him while he's gone. Well, no, it's neat that he's got the the author to interview. We've never had that happen, but in a way, we have that in it's every true. episode too. Yeah, I've considered doing stuff like that before too, but it's such a ordeal just trying to get all three of us together like this for the first time. Yeah. It, it, did do you remember if I asked Renee if she wanted to do this three way thing? <laughs> I mean, we would ask Janky S. Carlo to leave the room, obviously. Uh, I don't know if you asked her now. You had mentioned to me that you wanted uh, to also try a three-way with Renee, but... Oh, shoot. That's funny. I'm back. <laughs> what I missed? Uh, you missed some good stuff. <laughs> Rich Outfield. Funny fellow. <laughs> There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.